up uh, to be here on Sunday nights and be a part of our, that's our, of course, that's our discipleship time um, where we get to meet in small groups, dig a little deeper. Give me just a second to finish. Um, and so if you signed up for that, I'm going to give you your book tonight. If you didn't sign up for that and you want to sign up for that, and I mean, this is, um, I hate to be that rude, crude dude, but you, you got to be here. You got to be here on Sunday nights to be a part of this. I'm making the exception for you because you're going to do it. Um, and actually, I even told one, um, she had to make a decision to either her D group or this. And she flat out said, I, and I told him, I said, I'm not trying to be, I don't want you, and when I said that, I don't want you to get overloaded. So, because it would be hard to keep up with the normal D group study that uh, uh, was put out through the adults and everything, and then try to keep up with this as well. You can, do you, do you understand you can study too much? Does that make sense? I mean, it, it sounds terrible to say that you can study the Bible too much, but if you study too much, can you really retain everything? And so that's like right now they've really decided to get rid of all this, um, read a chapter a day, read a, two or three chapters a day. They're starting to see that nobody's retaining that, that it needs to be in small little bits. And so in this book, you'll have a daily study, and it is 15 minutes each day is about how much time it will take up. But it's your choice whether you make that last longer than 15 minutes, whether you look at it, um, whether you take the time to write in it, fill it out, things like that. Uh, so if you want to be a part of our Sunday night small group studies, uh, let me know. I'll put your name right here. Also, students who are a part of this Sunday night small group students get a t-shirt that says this on the front. Okay, this is the front of your t-shirt. This is the back of it. It says Mission Baptist Youth Life Givers. That's going to be the name of the group because our job is to make disciples who make disciples. We want to invest in people that invest in other people because actually I'm going to preach on a little bit of that tonight. I'm going to speak about um, just where some Christians are at in their faith. Um, may, and because we forget about the gift that was given to us. Uh, because I ask, um, I put on Facebook, Instagram this week, um, if the stone that was rolled in front of Jesus' tomb could speak to you, what would it say? Would it say that you need to be saved? Would it say that you need to rededicate? Would it say whatever it is that's between you and the Lord? And so one of the things that I put on there is that we look for God to move mountains, when we forget about the stone that he moved. Does that make sense? Um, so I want you to make sure, and whenever you sign up for something like this, I want you to take it serious for sure, um, because what you're going to do as this group, you're going to text each other throughout the week. You're going to talk to each other and say, hey, what'd you get out of today? Well, be honest, I haven't looked at it today yet, but I plan on looking at it tonight or whatever it is, and to let each other know what you're gathering out of this. And then on Sundays, we're going to come together and we're going to talk about your week. And we're going to look at it. We're going to dissect it. So everybody, because some of the stuff you may read, you're like, huh, I don't really get that. And I want you to get it. I want you to make sure you understand it. I want to make sure you leave that Sunday night knowing everything that you read and understanding the truth of God's word that's in there for you. So um, I bought 15 books uh, because I had about 10 people sign up. So I wanted to have a few extra. And don't worry, if we get more, I can order more uh, because John... Uh, who's the rep with Sun, Sun Life is a good friend of mine and will send me whatever I need. So again, if, make sure if you want to do that, that you sign up for it. Um, I'll leave this down here next to the books and I need your shirt size with it as well. Uh, that's what it will look like as a whole. So, um, and I, I just want to make sure that um, not to be rude to people who just show up on Wednesday night, but I want this to make something for the Sunday night crew where they feel a little set apart because they are set apart because they are going further in their study. They are going further in their walk with God. And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight too. Okay. Does that make sense? Everybody's good. All right. So tonight we're going to be talking about the gift. And so if I give you a gift, would it make you happy? Yes, of course it would. Because this week it was Joe's teacher's birthday, and so me and him had to go to the, the greatest place in the world to buy a teacher a present, which is Walmart. Walmart. Yes, so um, that's where dads go to shop because we don't really know how to shop anywhere else for our wives or anybody else in our family. So um, took Joe to Walmart, and we went through picking out a gift, and, and can you guess what, what we...
No. 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 But it smells. Candles. Yes. Yeah. So, so who doesn't like a Sonic gift card? Everybody does. Okay. Um, so, so. At, at Sonic, yes, it's holy ground there at Sonic in Cassville. Um, so we take our shoes off and we eat there now. But no, I'm just kidding. Um, so what we, well, I, I thought, because this is something that we're trying to look at to do maybe as a way to give back to the teachers who have just went above and beyond this year for the COVID. This is the school staff in general, not just teachers. And I've been trying to figure out a way where our church can invest back into these these teachers let them know we really appreciate them and so my wife came up with this great idea because I was like gift cards or something what can we do for them and she says everybody loves Sonic everybody loves Sonic whether it's just uh, you go there for a, a smoothie a slush or whatever they're called or something to eat or whatnot and so I thought yeah we're just gonna get gift cards for all of them and just dish them out and we're still in the works to do that so everybody loves a gift correct so we want to talk about the gift you've been given, because a lot of times if people ask you, what's your spiritual gift, do you freeze up? Absolutely, because you don't know what it is. A lot of you are sitting there going, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. I have no idea. So we're going to talk about the gift that was given to you so freely, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 for this first verse. And so I want you to understand what is given to you, because do you think Christians forget the gift that has been given to them? Yes, because a lot of times when you ask me about your spiritual gift, do they automatically think about something that they do for the Lord or that they do for the church? Okay, we start thinking, what is the gift that God has given me with the ability to do something further for Him? But I want to flip that around a little bit and help you understand the gift that's given to you, okay? And so for me this week, I had to really examine some gifts that were given to me because there is... Um, a part of life that is great, and there's a part of life that sucks. Would you agree? You're either in one or the other. You can't, if you start mixing them both together, you really just get confused. So you have a side of your life that's good, and you have a side of your life that's bad. Like for me today, if you ask me how my day was, it's just like, it's just an average day. I really didn't have anything bad happen, I didn't have anything, you know, spectacular happen, and I'm okay with that. That's a good day. Anytime I don't end up on YouTube or my name becomes a verb, I'm pretty excited. Okay, so. Um, but then I have bad days, like yesterday when my outdoor stove started making noises that I didn't understand why it should be making it, and I'm, automatically you start thinking dollar amount. What's it going to cost to fix this machine that cost us 6800 when we first bought it? And so you're going, oh no, it's broke down. Snow and sleet and all that stuff's supposed to be here Monday night and Tuesday morning, and I'm going, well, I got propane, but the, there's nothing like wood heat. Wood heat is the best. And so... Anyway, um, I'm trying to get all this stuff done so you can have days that really stink and you can have days that really, really good. Can you marry those two together? I want to change your mind tonight about your spiritual gifts that you're trying to find, your spiritual gifts that you're trying to seek out. Because if someone can sing, because I have my days where I would love to have a youth praise and worship band, but I just, God hasn't filled that for us. I don't have youth that are that are musically inclined i don't have i mean i probably have some that can sing but i don't have i don't have a rock and guitar player because my my wife has been over there doing music on wednesday nights and so i don't have a i don't have a drummer to to sit up here and really knock it out either so really for us for the longest time we did what was called christian karaoke okay <laughs> It is, and we're probably going to move back into that pretty soon, okay? We would put the music, the music would play over the speakers, the lyrics was up there, and that's why I told everybody, we have the best Christian karaoke around. Everybody gets to sing. So anyway, because you think of your spiritual gift, well, that person can sing, and I, don't, I can't sing. That person can play the guitar, and I can't do that. That person can speak really well or has the gift of gab, and I don't. Uh, this person may be prettier than me or taller than me. We start looking at different ways, and we get people envy. And so we start to feel like we have nothing to offer at all. Because how many of you have felt like spiritually you have nothing to offer at all to the Lord? You may feel like you have something now, but at one point in your life, did you feel like, I don't have squat to give? There is nothing for me to give. I, trust me, I may feel that on Monday. Um, so I want to talk to you about what's given to you. I don't want to be talking about what you're giving out first, but what you're, what's being given to you that all Christians need to understand. Because this whole message is about the truth. 
All these series that we're talking about, I want to make sure that you have the truth in your life. Because does the world try to fill your head full of lies of what the truth is? Everything right now is so distorted. Religion is like Golden Corral. Do you like Golden Corral? Do you like to go there and eat? Because who doesn't like the chocolate fountain in there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everything <laughs> love the chocolate fountain. Okay. But then you have all these food bars. So if you like, uh, you want Mexican tonight, there's a food bar right there. You want uh, steak and whatever, it's right there in front of you. You want seafood, it's right down here. And you'll... And, and the list just goes on. The dessert bar is huge. Everybody loves to... There's, there's something for everyone at Golden Corral. So I start thinking that religion is the same way. I don't like this one. I'll go over here. I don't like this one now. I'll go eat down here. What am I in the mood for today? And that's the way a lot of Christians live. What am I in the mood for today? And I want to forget the mood for what I'm in the mood for and start remembering about the gift that was given to me, which was Jesus Christ dying on a cross, so I don't burn and go to hell. And so when it talks in here, it says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Now, now, I want to ask you, what is the most important spiritual gift that you have? You're going to overthink the living crap out of this. Praying, joy, salvation, Let's elaborate on that, okay? That's the route I'm going. What's the biggest spiritual gift you have? Of course, it's I'm saved, but the next thing is, what do I do with that gift? Do what? Ask for forgiveness, you pr- repentance, okay? What else do you do with this spiritual gift? What do you do with it? How do you put it to work? I mean, I know the Bible says faith without works is dead, Sharing what? Your testimony. Yes. It, the biggest thing, the biggest spiritual gift you have, if you're in this room and you are saved and have Jesus Christ as your Savior, the biggest spiritual gift you have is your testimony because no one else has a testimony like yours. I was in a discussion today with several youth pastors that was talking about repentance, and we're trying to figure out how do we get that across to our youth students where they fully understand what repentance is. Because for years with repentance, I was taught that that meant to turn away. Do you know what the Greek word repentance means? Change your mind. But there's more to it. It's not just that. Because churches will, we will take people in and we will um, give them the gospel, hopefully. Um, Seems to be a struggle right now. But uh, not here, but um, give them the gospel. Tell them about uh, this free gift that God wants to give to them, which is eternal life and, and in paradise when we all pass on and, or if we're here when Christ comes back. And we fail, a lot of times churches fail to talk to you about repentance, to explain that to you. Because when we, when we think about when we get saved and we're supposed to turn away is what was taught all through the 80s to me, turn away from sin, am I able to do that? Am I able to turn away from sin? And so we start setting teenagers up, just for me in youth ministries, I start setting teenagers up to think if, oh no, I got saved last night, but I cussed today, I must have not got saved, I must not have turned from my sin, my repentance must not be there, so now I'm a horrible person and there's no way that God can save me because I can't even turn away from sin, I can't move. But when you change your mind about something, is it a process? Yes. And so I want you to understand, if you have salvation, and because my wife has heard me explain this to to teenagers before that have have been saved and said, okay, what are you dealing with right now? And I remember one young lady saying, I'm dealing with cussing. I'm dealing with a bad attitude. I'm dealing with this. And she went down through the list. And I said, hey, that's awesome that you know this is what you're dealing with. But guess what? Tomorrow, you're probably going to say a cuss word. Tomorrow, you're probably going to get angry. Tomorrow, you're going to deal with this, this, and this again. The deal is, is to start to work to put it to death. That's the, how repentance works. When you start to try and push that sin out of your life. Because not everybody in this room may have, have struggled or is struggling with cursing or any other kind of... I mean, that's just what I hear out of everybody's mouth most of the time during the day is filthy language. Or attitude or whatever sin that you may be struggling with. For me, cursing is something that I have... You can say that you've squashed and put it to death, but does that mean a foul word never enters my mind? 
I mean, let me drop something on my toe. Okay, we were ornery little kids. We used to love to sit behind, below my grandma's window while she was washing dishes and fire a shotgun off just to make her say a cuss word because she was a, just a prim and proper, holy, assembly of God woman. I mean, just Pentecostal all the way, and there was nothing. If my grandfather would say, dang, she'd spit because that was just something that was done in her generation. If somebody said a cuss word and you didn't approve of it, you spit. Don't, I don't get, it's not really ladylike to spit, is it? I don't think so. But anyway, she would do that. And so if we could make Granny say a cuss word, we felt like we achieved something because she's just so prim and proper. And so had she, I mean, is that, was that sin? Did that happen that day to her? She said a filthy word. Of course, it really relied on us because we made it happen. But if you, you, can you ever really put sin to death? You try your best. Repentance means to change your mind. The day you get saved, that's when Christ and the Holy Spirit start to work on you to get you to stop sinning, to let you know that this is wrong. I need to ask for forgiveness. You can say the word repentance all day long, but does it mean that sin is dead to you? It, we live in a sinful world, and it has the option to creep back into your mind. Sexual sin, immoral sin, or whatever sin you want to throw in there, it has a way to creep back in there. Just by having it flash in front of your face one time, can it trigger? I mean, the biggest trigger of a memory or anything that can get your mind started is a smell. You can smell something that reminds you of a time when you did something wrong, and now you start thinking about it again. There's all kinds of things that can trigger your sin, but a spiritual gift that is given to each of us so we can help each other is our testimony. That's where it starts. We start talking about that, and then we get even further where we start talking about the sin that's in our life that we're trying to work on. We start talking about the problems with our close friends, the ones that you can count on not to go tell your bros and everybody else about it, not to put it on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and everything else where people can see what's wrong with you. And so with that in mind, I want you to make sure that, that you know the truth of your salvation is that you are saved. And Romans tells me that nothing can snatch that out of God's hand. That's the truth, the ultimate truth that I want everybody through this truth series to understand. If you have Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith and trust, okay, it, it goes further than just believe. It's your faith and trust in it. When I get on an airplane, do I have faith that that plane is not going to crash? Well, absolutely, I got on it. Do I put my trust in the pilot who is sitting behind the wheel? Yes. It's no different than me putting my faith and trust in Jesus. I trust that that guy up there that I've never met before in my life, face to face, is going to get me there. Do I put my faith and trust in a Christ that I've never met before face to face is going to lead me into heaven one day? Absolutely. And so we get into Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Thank you, I am a gift. No. Um, their, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. But here's where I want to stop just real quick. I want to go back to 11 because it says the church. The, now, we're, we're talking about New Testament area, era church. So we have the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. This is anyone who is advancing the gospel. This is anyone who is telling the story. Do you feel like you're a gift to your church? If you don't, you need to get over yourself because you are. If you're one of those students who is investing time in other people, you are a gift to the church. And I don't mean like a gift to Mission Baptist Church. I mean the church, God's people, God's holy union, His saved people. You are a gift to the church that's here. And so you are a gift if you are one of these people that are teaching that, and I, I know you got your own idea of prophets, and, but can you be an evangelist? And I don't mean Billy Graham, but can you be an individual evangelist during the day? Yes. You can tell people about Jesus. You can spread the gospel, which is what we, you know, for me, that's what I love to do. I love to invest in teenagers to teach them how to share their faith with people because one day I'm going to be standing up there. I don't, I don't know what it looks like. We know what people talk about. Well, I'm standing in line to get into heaven today. And so when they die, I don't know if there's like you take a number or whatever. But anyway, on the, the day Christ returns, I don't know if I'll be, you know, I think it's going to be more efficient than a Chick-fil-A, you know, drive-through, uh, which is pretty good. But 
You're going to be standing there, whatever that looks like, trying to get into heaven on Judgment Day, and you got all that. You got a line here, and you got a line over here, and you don't really understand what that line's over there until you see one of your friends, and they start screaming. Why didn't you tell me? Because that's the line that's saying, "I don't know you. Get out." That's my heartbreaking day because there's going to be people in that line that have every right to scream and yell at me. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me this place called hell was real? Why did you wait up until your 30s to start advancing the gospel with this salvation that you've had all your life? That's why I don't want you to be like teenage me. I got saved at 12. I went to church, did everything I thought I was supposed to do, but I never told any of my friends about Jesus. That's on me. There's going to be a lot of people standing in line to get into heaven one day, whatever that looks like, that are going to be screaming at me, why didn't you tell me? Because this place called hell is real. And I don't really want to face them. If I have a feeling that if I try to turn away from them, something's going to make me look at them. And I'm not really looking forward to that day because there's people that I know that have died that I know they're in hell right now. I've talked to the family, I've talked to everybody. Never got saved, and it is teetotally on me because I didn't take the time to have one conversation. The Bible says all I have to do is plant the seed. All I have to do is give an introduction. There's a three-dot theology to salvation. I do the introduction. The Holy Spirit does the next. God takes care of the salvation part. I can't do anything about two and three, but I can do something about the first part. That's why I love for you to download the Life in Six Words app. That's why I love for you to use that. Okay, so it moves on in here and it says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. This is why I love Sunday night. Because we get to dig into deeper like this where we're no longer, and I don't mean immature like we're running around like Joe and all the kids out here making noise, playing tag and all that stuff. I don't mean picking your nose immature. I mean immature in your faith. Because if you were here Sunday night when we had our pancake feed, we went through the four chair. Does anybody want to know what chair number one is? Chair number one is the lost. That's where the lost person sits. Chair number two is the person who gets saved, who's now the believer. Chair number three is the worker. Chair number four is the disciple maker. But too many times we get into worker and we jump right back into believer because being a worker is too much sacrifice. It takes too much time. So we're more comfortable being the believer. Because once you're a believer, you can't go back to chair one. But it's really easy to get all the way to chair four and dive right back into chair two because you don't want to put the time in. And Sunday night is when we get to put that extra time in. When we get to dig into God's word deeper and start to look at these things. That's Because Paul would go back and scold people and say, you're still on the milk, okay? You're still on the milk. Get off the milk and start getting into the real meat of the gospel. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is what I want you to do. I want you to give it. Easier said than done though, right? You get it, you give it. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 15.3 says, I passed on to you what was most important. This is Paul talking. What had been, what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture says. This is my call. This is what I'm supposed to do is I pass on what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Has the gospel of Jesus Christ been passed on to you? You get to choose what you do with that. You get to choose whether you just keep it between you and God or if you let everybody else in your life know that. You get to choose whether you sit in chair one or chair two or do you really care enough to jump into three? Do you care enough to jump into four? Because is giving it easy? Is being a giver hard to do? At Christmas time, which do you love more, getting or giving? Now be 100% honest. We are in church, okay? But what do most people? 
if they're really honest with themselves. Because if you went all through Christmas, never got a gift, and just totally give, would there be at some point you'd be like, man, I didn't get nothing. I'd be bummed out. Yes, because it's, it's tough to give up your own time because this is the deal we have to ask ourselves. When we want, you want grace, and do you want, can grace and work marry together? Can a good day and a bad day marry together? Can grace and a horrible day go together? Because do you have days where you go through that are just totally terrible and you feel like there's no grace involved in it at all? You do. And I want you to look, we're going to look on through 1 Corinthians 4, or 15, 4 through 10. It says, he was buried and he was raised from the dead. Talking about Jesus. On the third day, just as the scripture says, he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers. At one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him, for I am the least of the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without result, for I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me in his grace. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you read this and really examine Paul, you'll think he's bipolar. Because it's like, I'm the worst. Why did Paul think he was the worst? Yes, because he persecuted God's church. So Paul was putting his sin on a level, right? Now, we all know that a lie to God is the same as murder. It's just straight across the board. But Paul went through this going, you know what? No one's worse than me. But you know what? Nobody worked harder than I did to spread the gospel. What are you, Paul? Are you good or are you bad? Can you have both together or do they need to be separate? See, the problem is, is getting people in the church to get involved, to be thankful for the gifts God given them to do something. I'm going to tell you, this last Saturday, I wanted to burn this place down. Because my wife had me doing some of the most hardest jobs in the whole world I felt like in this church. If you could see my knees right now, you would understand I went through some excruciating pain on Sunday or Saturday. If you could see the two gouges in my shoulder from the rafter hooks that gouged into my shoulder Saturday night crawling through the rafters of this church to run two wires that my wife had to have ran through the top of the church and then I had to go underneath the church and crawl underneath to run some wires up through the floor and there's rocks, there's spiders, there was a skunk under this so I had a gun with me underneath there. Then I got to thinking, crap, if I fire the gun it's going to hit a brick, it's going to ricochet off and hit me in the head and I'm going to lay under here dead. She's going to be too scared to get underneath here so we're just going to close me up and bury me under the church, okay? That was my thought process for the night and I'm sitting there, was I not complaining? Go ahead. Oh, I was mad because I got underneath that, that church and she's sitting there going, there's a trap door under here. And I'm going, no, there ain't. And I'm, I mean, there's like this much room to crawl. And I'm looking up and I'm going, mm -mm, it's not there. I can see the wires that come from the back of the church and go up inside. But she's like, two rafters back, there's a crawl space right there. And I said, as God is my witness, there is nothing under here to crawl squat through. And so then, what do we do? We go, and like the Bible says, we get another Christian to come help us in our argument. So Carl shows up. Carl comes under the church with me and goes, she's crazy. There ain't no hole underneath here. And then through further examination, we find this little spot about yay big that's cut in the bottom of the church. And we go like this. Do you think the board went up? Absolutely not. That board is a liar and the devil was inside that board. Okay, so I was mad because she said that's the trap door and it would, would not move. Now, it was there. <laughs> and so there was some pretty good arguing going on between the floor joists between me and her. Finally to the point she's like, I'm done talking to you. So, um, good, I mean, we're still married today. It's okay. The D word never entered in. But they had screwed it shut from the top when they built it. Somebody had what they call a brain fart and drilled it shut, the access from the bottom. Now, if I could have figured out, if I knew whose name that was, who did that that, that Saturday evening, I would have called them on my phone and it would have been, it would have been something ugly and they probably wouldn't stop coming to church, period. But let me get, yes, we got a wrecking bar and a hammer and we broke that out and we said, you know what, just like 
the Jesus broke in with the, with the 12 or the 11. With the 11, when they were scared after Jesus was crucified, we broke into the room and said, ha ha, we're here. Uh, so we went in. Carl grows up inside, runs the wires and everything else. And I get up the next morning and I'm hurting all over. My knees hurt. My shoulders hurt. Everything on me, my elbows are scratched up still from it. It was a terrible, horrible experience. And you know what God said to me? Why are you griping? I've given you a gift. I've given you a body that has the ability to crawl through the rafters. I've given you a body that has the ability to crawl underneath the church. And yeah, you suffered a little bit for me, but I've given you a gift. And the problem is, look at all these empty chairs in here tonight. Nobody is willing to get uncomfortable. Nobody's willing to sacrifice anything for the gospel anymore for Jesus. Nobody's willing to sacrifice anything for the church. Nobody's willing to sacrifice anything for the person sitting next to them at school, at work, at home. Nobody's willing to do that. I had some kids one time that they didn't come to church, but they really wanted to because one of the most touchy things you can talk to about teenage athletes is playing sports on Sunday. I've had students who quit coming here because I preached not really against it, maybe a little bit. Okay, I did. Um, but they'd tell me, well, we had a 15-minute Bible study before the ball game started, and my response was wrong. I said, well, ain't that cute? Did they sacrifice anything? No. They were still at what they wanted to do. They made themselves feel better because a lot of people show up at church on Sunday to mark off a I did it list. I feel good about myself. A lot of people will show up at youth on Wednesday night to check it off a list. This is what I did. You know what? Hardly anybody shows up on Sunday night because nobody wants to sacrifice their weekend or any time to dig further and deeper into God's Word to have a relationship with Him. And I don't know how to fix that. All I know how to do is give the introduction, and I let the Holy Spirit do the rest, and then it's between them and God. Everything, your salvation, your whole relationship with God, I can't do anything about it. I can give an introduction. I can speak a message tonight. I can speak at a retreat. I can, you know, the, the first time I went up to Kansas City, 3,000 some people, and I'm sitting there blinded by this. I couldn't even see anything but, the, but the, the nosebleed section. You give the introduction. You don't really know what goes on out there. I have no idea how God is working in your heart right now. I'm not trying to scold you. I'm just trying to make sure you stay on the right path. If you are getting deep into your word, I want you to understand God does not ignore your sacrifice. There's people that go out on the weekend on boats. That's me and God's time. Me and God spend time together out there on the boat. Well, yeah, you could be praying to God, but what if something tugs on that line? Your prayer life's over. I'm now doing what I wanted to do. There's no sacrifice in it. And I'm not telling you you got to be up here seven days a week like we are, doing everything under the sun for whatever. But there has to be some sacrifice in our life because a gift was given to us that we do not deserve. A gift was given to me. Paul says, I'm the worst sinner there is. Nobody authorized the killing of Christians like me. And Paul was smart. He studied under the, what we would call the Yodas of Mosaic Law. He knew. He studied under the top people. He knew all this stuff. But yet he still went out and killed Christians. And he says, I'm the worst sinner. But I worked the hardest because I knew what was given to me that I didn't deserve. Now, everybody in this room, I'm going to assume, has never murdered anybody. But God has given you a gift that you never, ever, ever deserved. That's why it's so hard to wrap your mind around the gospel of Jesus. That's why it's so hard to understand why God would send Christ in the most vulnerable form. We were talking about it this week, me and my dad. He's like, isn't it crazy how a calf is born and it knows to get up and suck from its mother? It's weird. We were looking at, uh, we have five turkeys at our house now, and we were looking at those turkeys, and I said, isn't it weird how they know immediately to start scratching at the ground and what they can and can't eat? Prove to me God doesn't exist. 
how an animal can just inertly know how to just eat, how it knows to get up, to walk, to move, what predators to stay away from, how it knows to hide, all this stuff. Convince me God's not real. Yeah. Migra- yeah, we talked about that too with the geese and migration. I was talking to people. I was actually witnessing today to five lost people. And we were talking about um, evolution. And I said, you know, if we came from monkeys, why'd it stop? If we walked out of the ocean, whatever you want to believe, why did it stop? And I was able to talk to them about Darwin's theory because everybody knows that Darwin had a theory that was against God. But did you know at the end of Darwin's theory, Darwin said, I got it all wrong. There's only one true God. I got it wrong. But they don't teach you that. They leave that part out because that doesn't fit their agenda. When I had that friend who was a Buddhist and he said, you know, when I, when I die, I believe we just become a part of the, the, the or the atmosphere, whatever it is. We become a, we come a part of the light. And so I got to say, I believe whenever we die that we burn and go to hell if we don't have Jesus Christ as our Savior. But I believe if we do, we spend an eternity in heaven. Which one of us has the most to lose if we're wrong? I get to choose what I do with the gift that I'm given. The spiritual gift that you're given is to dig deeper and have a relationship with Him. The spiritual gift you're given is to tell somebody your testimony, why you felt the need to even be saved, what was tugging at your heart. Because something could be tugging at a lost person's heart right now, and they don't understand why. And this is tugging at the heart because God is waiting on you to tell them so they can understand. God is waiting on you to get uncomfortable. God is waiting on you to take that fully functional mouth, just like He told Moses, who made your mouth? Who made your tongue? I did. So I can use it if you'll let me. Is sharing the gospel with people so scary? I'm glad you're not sitting up here because I'm spitting. Is sharing the gospel with people terrifying? It is because we're scared to death of what they're going to think about me. I'm more scared to death of what they're going to think about the God I'm introducing them to, whether they believe it or not. I've had better conversations. Some of you went to LTC with us, saw me witness to a satanic worshiper. I had a better conversation with the satanic worshiper than I did to Jehovah's Witness. You'll get into a bigger argument with someone who believes close to you, close to what you believe in, versus someone who believes the opposite of you. Do you think a devil worshiper believes in God? Yes. And that was one thing that broke the barrier between me and him. He started talking about the devil and all that stuff, and I said, you know what? I admire you. And I seen a wall break down. And I said, you believe in something most churches won't preach about. He said, what's that? I said, hell. And I just broke it. He said, you know, I believe in your God. I believe he exists. I just choose to worship the devil. And if you ever want to hear about how that story went, I'd love to tell you because it was an amazing story with that guy. It was weird, uh, but it was amazing. So moving on so I can get you out of here. When I get it, this is what I want you to understand. When I get it, John 15, 9, because this is kind of a warm up. This is the message I'm preaching Friday night at that retreat. Um, when I get it. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by Himself. He does only what He sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Where do you find out what the Father does? (laughs) I have to read this thing. People act like this is a sacrifice to pick it up and spend 15 minutes to read a verse and meditate on it. And say, God, speak to me how this, and this is what I love some people do. God, I'm just going to pick one. No, don't do that. (sighs) Anyway, this is how you, this is what you do. You do what the Father says to do. What's the Father tell you to do in Matthew 28? Go share the gospel. To go out and do it. I have people that are all the time, can you talk to my teenager about suicide, sex, uh, bad grades, uh, depression, drugs, everything else under the sun. Let me tell you what, if you'll start following what the Father says, all that stuff will fall into place. Does it mean depression won't come find me? No. Jesus modeled how to deal with anxiety and depression when he went to the garden to pray. 
Okay? He admitted to himself he had a problem because when he's praying to God, who's he talking to? Himself. He admitted to himself he had a problem. He took three of his best bros with him, even though they fell asleep on him. Friends will let you down. He knew what to do. He knew to take it to God. He knew to tell himself he had a problem. And he knew he needed to tell at least three close friends what's going on in his life. Did Jesus model what to do with depression and anxiety? Yes. That was the biggest thing. If we will lead people to Christ, depression, anxiety, drugs, sex, everything else under the sun that has a a teen cram on top of him, everything will fall into place. We have to do as the Father does. Jesus even did what God instructed him to do. We get to choose. Now, do I always knock it out of the park? No, because I have days where I'm crawling under a church mad because the trap door is nailed shut. Figuratively. Last year when my mom died, did I feel like going to camp? Did I feel like preaching my mom's funeral that morning and going to camp? I did not. Her words from her hospital bed rang in my ear that I don't care what is wrong with me, you're still going to go spread the gospel of Jesus. So I preached her funeral and I went straight on to camp. And because of a gospel conversation I got to have with a pastor, the pastor's message got changed, people got saved. Caleb got saved. Then I go straight into LTC. Why? Because I know when I looked at my mother's body in that hospital room, her gift had come full circle. I want your gift to come full circle. I want the person next to you's gift to come full circle. I want you to understand what gift you have, that salvation that's in your heart. I want you to understand all of that. In Luke 9, 23, 24, then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Is that confusing? To a new believer, it is. To someone you're trying to share the gospel to, it is. You have to explain to them, this is what I've given up. This is what I've gained. Everybody's picture is different. Just like when I talked to those guys today about repentance. I can't go talk to a student who grew up in a home full of drugs, fighting, and nastiness the same as I can talk to a student who grew up in church their whole life. The repentance for each one of them looks different. It all has a process, though, and that process leads back to the cross, the grave, and the command to go out and share the gospel. To the last verse in the book of Revelation. No, I did not put the S on it. It's not Walmart's. Okay? This is all I want you to understand tonight is the gift that you've been given. You need to give it. You need to be willing to sacrifice some things because something was sacrificed for you that I can never repay. Just like that back there on that wall, that life in six words that we have up. My sins cannot be removed by good deeds. I can't earn my way into heaven. If I wait to get myself right before I get saved, I'll never get saved. It's like waiting till you have enough money to afford to have a baby. There is no, you'll never have children if you wait till that moment. You never will. I want you to understand the gift you've been given does demand some sacrifice. And I don't mean you have to give up everything in your life because that's the way we look at it. Oh, the preacher asked me to give up something for this, the gospel. Does anybody in this room deserve it? God says you do. And he gave it to you with a cost, but not from you. Jesus wrote the check and it cleared Tell four people this week your testimony. I'm going to do the same thing to the New Sight kids Friday night that I do to you guys every year at camp. You have to share your testimony with four people before you leave camp. How much fun is that? It's terrifying because there are stories of people at church camp being eaten for sharing the gospel, right? No. <laughs> But you know what that does? It sparks a movement. It sparks a movement. That's why we have Dare to Share Live, because we like for you to go out and share your faith. Because who here is the first person that can knock on a door? 
Does anybody have the gift to be able to just walk up and knock on a door? You're not scared of what people think. I mean, but I've been conditioned for it. I have a job where I'm used to seeing people. No, no. People hate to see me coming most of the time. Okay, so I'm okay with knocking on a door. If they run out the... I mean, no kidding. We went to spread the gospel and hand out vacation Bible school flyers one time in a town close to us. And I knocked on a door and literally a guy goes running out the back. And I took off around the back going, no, no, I got a, I got a Bible school flyer for you. I want your kids to come to church and I want to share the gospel with you. It didn't matter. He was gone. So I don't mind doing that. But how many of you are Aaron? Does anybody know that Moses... He couldn't do it, but he needed backup. How many of you are good at being that person standing there when the person who's sharing to begin with forgets something and you interject? That you, you are, and really just having, because did Jesus send people out to share the gospel by themselves? Did Jesus send the disciples out by themselves? No, he sent them out in groups. Why? Because you need that encouragement, even if it's just the person standing there holding the literature, holding whatever holding you up. We all, have a, we all have a gift. We all have a job. We have something to give to our youth group, to our church, to our community, to our family, and to Christ who gave us a free gift. Did it all make sense? I hope so. I hope you guys enjoyed tonight. I hope you guys um, have something that you can take out and give to your friends, your family. Share with four people this week, as I told you. Uh, this is how... Um, this all even got started. I commissioned five kids to go out and share with four people. And the next night, the next Wednesday night, I had 16. Then I commissioned those to do the same. And it just blew up and it grew and it grew and it grew. And a lot of times, do you know why churches die? Because they stop sharing their faith. They stop doing outreach. They stop sharing the gospel with people. I don't want that to be us. Do I push you? To share that push you too hard sometimes you may feel like it but it's because God's given you a gift and I don't want you to waste it I want you to sign up for Sunday night some of you already have but I want you to do it because you want to not because I told you to because you want to not because you want a t-shirt because you want to dig deeper into what God's trying to speak to you and we need to invest in others that show up here normally these chairs are all full and tonight they're empty and I have no idea why. But as my good friend Greg Steer says, go with the goers and pray for the rest. Does anybody want to close? I do. All right.